So, um, I've been asked to speak today on the mysterious topic of what is the future of the prevention of violence against women. Um, I'm not clairvoyant, so I can't guarantee accuracy on this, but I will, I will do my best. It's slightly ambitious, Michael, I thank you for that, but um, let's, yeah, let's give it a go. All right, um, now if I press this, ah, oh, fantastic. I thought before going on to the future, it might be good to just think a bit about the present and, and see where we are now, where we are now, or at least the very near past. And it's also important to note that um, uh, prevention can't exist in isolation from a very good response system. And so women's services, DV services, rape crisis services are, are crucial to prevention because without, and of course the justice and police response, without that being in place, prevention work can uh, lead to disclosures of violence. We, we need to ethically be able to refer into a, into a good system. Um, but anyway, so just I suppose in the last 10 years, as, as Sue has you know, very kindly just sort of um, articulated for us, we've seen the emergence of a lot of uh, evidence and practice and policy on, on primary prevention. Um, again, no, by no means sorted, but we have an emerging evidence base. It was led by, worldwide, it was led by an Australian organisation. Uh, Vic Health was the, the very first in the world to uh, review all of the international evidence on what, what correlates with higher levels of violence against women, DV, sexual assault, other forms of violence against women. What sort of factors uh, run alongside that? What sort of factors seem to be contributing to that? And they looked at hundreds of studies worldwide and, and analysed the strengths and weaknesses of these different factors and looked for commonalities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what they found later because I think it's really important. But um, it was the, f yeah, we, we really have led the way here in Australia with pulling together that evidence. And it's since been reinforced by um, other reviews, as, as Michael Flood was saying, lots of reviews lately. WHO, European Commission has done one, uh, UNCSW just in 2013 did one too. Um, we also have a lot of great emerging evidence from uh, this in-depth research and uh, in particular demographics or settings, just like the research that's been uh, presented this morning on working with men and boys. Um, and of course we have learnings from uh, practice and programs on the ground and the evaluations of those programs. So we learn from what works and what doesn't work. But I think what we can, what we can safely say about this picture of, of the evidence is even at that high level review of you know, the, the Vic Health, WHO, EC sort of stuff, what we're still looking at is what is effective at the program level. What we, where we have our strongest evidence is what works at a, is at a, a, a project level, what works you know, in a particular intervention, whether it be in a school, with a community group or so forth. We haven't really started to build the evidence base about what works at a whole of population level. So what works for a policy to actually start bringing down, you know, levels of violence against women nationwide or even across the state. So that's, the, we, we really are lacking that sort of evidence um, and we need to build it. And we're in a good position to build it here in Australia. Um, the other, in terms of the existing sort of picture, we also of course have had a lot of evolving practice and that's been presented, um, we've seen a lot of that presented this morning. Um, and again, it did come out of a, a lot of the DV and rape crisis centres started doing this work, um, whether it was community awareness raising campaigns or work in schools um, and so forth. And what we sort of are classifying now as the first generation, I suppose, of primary prevention activities is that pure awareness raising. This is what violence looks like. This is the dynamics of it. This, it's wrong. It's against the law. You shouldn't do it. You know, it's, it's, it is primary prevention. It's aiming to stop the violence before it starts, but it's, you know, it's fairly limited, I suppose, in terms of the change it generates. Where we've got to now with this evolving evidence that, that Sue was presenting is this knowledge that if we really want to create attitudinal, behavioural, you know, practice change, we have to actively address the underlying causes of violence what's in people's heads, what's going on with power inequality and so forth, and actively challenge and, and, and sort of change those underlying causes, whether in a community or in an organisation, um, rather than simply raise awareness. So it's, it, it's, it's going a sort of extra mile. Raising awareness is good, but it's really only a first step. Um, and finally, um, what we've seen, I suppose, over recent years up into the present is increasing policy support and with that funding support at national and at state levels. 
bearing in mind the vagaries of policy support that Sue <laughs> very effectively outlined. So at the, at the national level, we have our, now our national action plan, uh, a national plan to reduce violence against women and their children. Um, Long-term 12-year plan, if anyone doesn't know, it's got bipartisan support, which is gold, and that I think is one of the reasons why it's been identified as, as leading internationally. Not many policies have, have support across political parties. Um, and the, the first action plan, in terms of its work on prevention, it tended to, I suppose, it was a bit hesitant, basically, is my, is my reading of it. It did, fun, it did two main funding streams. One was respect for relationships education, a whole grant stream, and one was um, communi uh, community, uh, I've forgotten the name of it, but community organisation grants. And they were substantial amounts of money and they went out to different projects across the country. And there have been, again, project evaluations of those. But it wasn't, I suppose, um, a more comprehensive approach for a transformative agenda of change, if you see what I mean. It was, it was small project funding to sort of seed the work and draw, and draw learnings. Now we're into the second action plan under this uh, national plan. I think it's uh, the, the creation of ANROS and, and of the foundation, our watch, has uh, taken it a step further. We've also seen the respect for relationships, education, to a certain extent, supported through the national curriculum. May it survive its injuries. Um, <laughs> it's, it, you know, it gives us a bit of a framework, I suppose, for starting to, to look at how the national policy context can support and, and carry forward the work. And just, yeah, just to finish as well, of course we have state level policies. They're all quite different. They're at different stages. They, there are different approaches. We learnt today from the Minister that New South Wales is doing a, pr a primary prevention plan, which is, is very exciting news, um, and uh, different jurisdictions as well have different approaches to this. So, that's where we are, okay. What's missing, though? <laughs> um, I think a lot. I think that uh, for in terms of where, where we want to go, what the picture that we've got now then, if you, if you think of what I just described, re the practice and the evidence and the funding streams and so forth, we have all of these pockets of great practice, like the programs we heard about this morning, for example. And they exist in all, all around the country. We, and they've been, some of them have been evaluated well, some not so well, but you know, we get learnings out of them. Um, but there's nothing that sort of brings them all together. There's nothing that, uh, there's certainly no attempt to ev evaluate across the, the spectrum to see what, you know, what is working, what isn't working at that sort of level. And there's no sort of sense of how we all pull in the same direction, if you see what I mean, and don't do this sort of ad hoc approach, but actually have a, a, a sort of more, more comprehensive plan for, for achieving change. And I suppose that our jurisdictional context, our, our federal system means, of course, we have all of these different policy environments that we're working in. So what is missing is, I think, above all, this national approach that coordinates activity among all of the stakeholders, and that's, that's government at every level. Local government's very important to prevention too, I haven't mentioned them yet. Um, the women's organisations and the response sectors, co community organisations of all sorts, um, and academia. We need to work out some sort of way through which everyone's pulling in the same direction. To do that, we need to know what the direction is and how we get there. And that, I think, requires a, uh, you know, a lot of work on building a shared understanding of, of what it is we're trying to do, shared knowledge of what the underlying causes and contributors are to violence, of what works, what doesn't work, and of how we bring it all together. And you know, building ca the ca capabilities and skills that we need to then do that. Something that lifts good practice up, so something that doesn't let a program that has, you know, evaluates well, doesn't let it die when the funding runs out basically, or, or leave it up to community organisations to continue to run, you know, with limited support and limited money. We need some, we need some sort of way of identifying what works and, and supporting it to, to go forward at a, at a broader level. Um, and something, this is my, my big, you know, desire for, for this work in, in the next decade or so, um, something that builds evidence and monitors progress against agreed indicators for whole of population change. And that sounds really boring, but that, that, what I mean by that is some sort of national scorecard of how we are progressing against what we know to be the contributors to violence. We probably won't start to see, you know, on, uh, against the personal safety survey, we probably won't start to see violence itself come down, even if we do everything right. Because it's so complex, it's so entrenched, I don't think we'll start to see those levels come down for, I think, a decade, 
You know, I think it's a, this is a long-term cross-generational sort of uh, thing. But we, as we know what some of the contributors to violence are, we can start measuring change against that and we should be doing that at a population level. So in part to address some of this what's missing, um, the, my, my organisation was created, Our Watch, along with um, another very important national organisation under the national plan, which is ANROS, and may it at the back there, um, Australia's national um, research organisation for women's safety. I almost stumbled, but I got it. Um, so we're both, these two organisations were both, have, both have links to the national plan, ANROS is, is sort of comprehensively funded by all governments. Initially, the Foundation to Prevent Violence Against Women and Their Children, our, our old name, was funded only by the Commonwealth and Victorian governments. Um, it was just last year, it was created in July. We've since had South Australian and Northern Territory governments join, and we are hoping to get other governments to join. Um, and uh, it, we're, but we're an independent, not-for-profit organisation, so we have an independent board in our decision-making and our operations as at arm length from government. So I'm, I'm hoping that what we do, we focus on primary prevention as well, whereas ANROS, of course, does the, the spectrum of research across, across, the, across response to prevention. So I'm hoping that what our watch does can, can make a difference to uh, the, the future of violence prevention and address some of that what's missing in the national approach. Um, but of course it's not going to be simple and of course we can't do that alone by any stretch. So, some of the challenges that I think we face as an organisation and anyone who's interested in prevention faces is that it is a, a relatively new area. The evidence is emerging and evolving. Um, you know, we're learning new things all the time. Um, we are addressing a very complex problem. We're not, we're not trying to What's a good example? <laughs> it's not straightforward. It's not linear. It's not it, you know there are very complex underlying causes that, that things interact. We're, we're you know we're in, in this um, you know complex social context as well. So it's it's closer to a wicked problem. It's closer to that sort of you know climate change, all sorts of things you know poverty that sort of thing than it is to I would argue something like smoking or drink driving, which is what it's often compared to. It's a bit more complex than that. Um, it is challenging very deeply held attitudes, particularly those around gender, um, that people really don't like to talk about and don't like to face. And whenever you do use, as, as Sue said, the, the F word, feminism, God, God help you, I mean, let alone gender, it, you, you'd, you'd see on uh, anything on social media, the backlash is immediate. The backlash is, uh, you know, in some ways, I think, getting worse now around this, this work um, with the one in three sort of movement of it's what about what about the men it's you know it's really it's really unfair all of that sort of stuff and I would argue that in some ways that <laughs> as hard as it is you could see that as a good sign in some ways you could think this is starting to bite um, it's really starting to hit home people are actually starting to think what I'm supposed to change and that's what's you know where where the sort of rubber hits the road um, we, we did our strategic plan through this um, sort of big consultation process. Um, we ad adopted the same vision as the national plan because it's a good one, an Australia where women and, and children live free from all forms of violence. That's where we want to get to eventually. Um, where we work, our objective is, is the underlying causes of violence. So we aim to change the attitudes, behaviours, social norms and practices that underpin and create violence against women and their children. And I just want to say, Michael Flood had a go at us earlier, said we only talked about attitudes. We don't. It's attitudes, behaviours, social norms and practices, and that's everywhere, and I'm cross with Michael. <laughs> and he ran away, and I didn't get to tell him. <laughs> of course, it is possible one of our communications documents got out that I didn't proofread, and it did have just attitudes on it, but we do address all of them. Um, so also, yeah, what, I mean, obviously the, the point down the bottom is very important. We're not the only ones doing this work. Lots of other people are involved in doing this work already. Um, thank, thank goodness. So what I think we aim to do is, is one, pr provide as much national level leadership as we can um, and also to act as a, a backbone organisation. We got that um, terminology from anyone who's uh, familiar with a collective impact idea that you have, you know, where you have all a lot of organisations working on a complex problem together. Um, it's important to have some sort of backbone, somebody that's sort of carrying the the evidence, the monitoring, and the advocacy for it. And so that's how we see our role, not as doing it alone, but but providing that support for others as well. Um, 
I've just, obviously, we're, going to, we're working. One of the ways in which we work is from an evidence base. Um, just to clarify, it's addressing the attitudes, behaviours, social norms, and institutional practices. Um, we <laughs> we do want to go to underlying causes. It's it's very important from what the evidence tells us that we don't just do a, a stand up. Violence is bad. We think everyone sort of knows violence is bad, and most people will say no to violence. Um, it, it, that's I mean. Obviously not everyone, but it's, it's that message we don't think is what primary prevention is about. We think we have to go deeper and look at what are the underlying um, attitudes and, and uh, social norms that are driving that. And we know from the evidence internationally and, and here that I think you can sort of get it into two categories. One is the, the structural power differentials between people and particularly between men and women. So unequal economic, social and political power. Um, and it, some of you might have seen that graph from the UN that um, matches uh, countries on their levels of gender equity and levels of violence against women. And there's, all, there's this direct correlation. Basically, in countries with higher levels of gender inequality, in education, in political power, economically and so forth, high levels of violence against women directly. And as the equality improves, uh, violence against women goes down. It's, it is true also down to the relationship level. Relationships where um, men are, hold the decision-making power, where men are seen as the ones that should be the breadwinners, should be the dominant ones in the relationship, where women have relatively lower uh, economic power, those are the relationships that the research shows are more likely to have domestic violence in them, where the man is more likely to perpetrate trade violence. Um, so it, it, that power differential is important. And I'm going to uh, you know, give some caveats to this in a minute. Um, the other important thing that is, a, I suppose, a contributor to violence, as proven in the international evidence, is this, the stuff in people's heads that Michael Flood talked about. Um, so it's attitudes, social norms. It's a bit more than that as well. It could even be learned and modelled behaviours. It could be, you know, um, the way people think they should behave because that's the way they think other people behave or what they think other people uh, think they should do. And particularly these around uh, rigid adherence to gender roles and stereotypes is again, on the international evidence, one of the largest contributors. Um, also as, as a very big contributor though is violence itself as a means of solving disputes um, or, or asserting dominance, particularly male dominance. So I, I suppose uh, what I, I did want to sort of unpick that a little bit and say that's, that's sort of what the international evidence picture is, is showing us. I think we have more to learn though on what the intersections are between these factors and other contributing factors to discrimination and disadvantage. And um, Eek have, was talking this morning about trauma, about the impact of colonisation, um, intergenerational trauma and, and so forth on Indigenous communities particularly. Uh, we should think about d disadvantage and discrimination on the basis of ethnicity, on the basis of disability, on the basis of sexual identity. How do all of these things uh, interact with and influence gender discrimination and unequal power on the basis of gender and what impact does that have on violence, and particularly violence against women, I think there's probably more work to do and it's probably uh, going to be different in different countries. We've been talking about reviews of international evidence, but you know that's probably going to be a bit more specific to particular national contexts and even smaller contexts. Um, I could talk about this stuff all day, but anyway, I think, I think, so I think there's more to do. There's also these other factors uh, as alcohol and drug abuse, um, childhood experiences of violence, socioeconomic disadvantage that have been shown to contribute as well to levels of violence against women. Um, but my understanding of the evidence is that those things, it's, it's complex, but, that, but in, in, to put it simply, that those things only come into play when you have these other determinants as well. So to take the alcohol example, uh, someone who has who totally believes in equality between men and women, who thinks that violence is abhorrent, would never commit an act of violence or so forth, can drink all they like. They're not like they're not likely to be violent, or I would argue that they're not going to be violent. Um, and by the same token, somebody who does have attitudes that think that they can they have the right to be violent towards someone under certain circumstances, they're likely to be violent even when they don't drink. But if you add alcohol or drug abuse on top of that, the violence is going to be more severe and potentially more frequent. So it's not to, I don't mean to dis dismiss these other factors, they are really important and we need to think about them in prevention, but we, we need to, I think, constantly think about them uh, under the lens of particularly the gender power inequities and gender stereotyping and, and broader cultures of violence. 
Okay. Oh, and the other thing I want to say about this, one more thing really important, is that what we, talk, what we talk about here in terms of underlying causes is not necessarily what you go into a program with. You know, when you, when you do the work, I'm sure with the NRL or, or, or you know, um, and, and any sort of work directly. I've talked to Scott a lot about your work in, in YMCA with workplaces. It's the messaging that you use at the individual level when you're, do, when you're doing prevention practice has to go to where people are. So I, I don't think it works to go in and say, it's all about unequal power and it has to be this. Eventually you might want to get there and you do, well, you might have to get there if you're going to make a difference. But the, the messaging that is, is used has to, I suppose, uh, bring people along is not always going to be the same as the messaging that's at a, at a high policy level. All right, I'll definitely stop now. Um, you've seen that a million times. I'll go on. Um, Okay, so our watch, just to uh, finish up, we decided then under our strategic plan that the ways in which we could work most effectively were these four work areas in, 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 over the next five years at any rate. Um, first one, lead a sustained and constructive public conversation. That's particularly about how we get involved in the media, how we work with the media as partners. We want to train journalists, we've got reporting guidelines, we want to do media awards, all sorts of things like that. But also how we write articles in the media and we try and, uh, you know, contribute to a, a more informed and, and robust public conversation on this. Um, number two, design and deliver innovative programs that engage and educate individuals in the community. This is um, uh, this could be interpreted as a lot of things, but it's it's mostly about getting to social marketing. Something we'd really like to do is is, is take on some of those strategies that we have seen used in, say, road safety, the, the TAC ads, that sort of thing, um, in smoking and so forth, and think about large scale communications campaigns that that reach people and and uh, make them think about um, attitudes and behaviour. Um, number three, enable organisations, networks and communities to affect change. Um, that's, uh, that's about how we could support some of the programmatic work. We don't think that we're going to be delivering programs because there's a lot of people already doing that, but there might be ways in which we can support good programs and, think, and, and work out a way to provide resources that are going to lift them up and enable other organisations or community groups or whatever to do those, those programs and do best practice work. And for influence public policy systems and institutions. So that's how we, we advocate and provide support to, to the policy level and the institutional level. All right, I'm going to flick through. I won't explain this, this diagram. I love a diagram. I did, I did this. This is simply to show... <laughs> simply. Um, <laughs> this is uh, to show how we will, we, it's a complex problem, it says up the top, we've got to work with other people, we'll implement a multifaceted program with mutually reinforcing activities, which is that public health sort of methodology. We work through those four areas that I just described, and I think the most important thing is those two circles down the bottom, which I, I doubt you can read, is, is to describe how we want to, we want to work across the whole population, and, and primary prevention is about addressing the whole population, but within that we need tailored approaches to particular groups of people that are going to address particular contexts and particular uh, complex underlying you know, causes and dynamics. So that would be in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, um, cultural and linguistically diverse communities and, and women with disabilities as, as the sort of priority groups in the first instance, but tailored approaches are necessary across the board. And the second intersecting circle is that we need specific initiatives for different age groups and adapted to different demographics. Obviously something that's going to work with a 14-year-old boy isn't going to be the same thing as it works, you know, at a whole of population level for the adult population. Okay. Um, I'm nearly finished. This is the third last slide. Um, we, we launched our new name and uh, website and strategic plan and all those things at the side there on the, third of, uh, sorry, the 5th of September this year. Um, so if you want to go to our, our website, that, that's it. We've got some uh, documents on it. We've got a theory of change, which we're calling an emerging theory of change because we think it's not something that's nailed down yet. Um, and it's got some a statement of our priorities over the first year as well. But one thing I do want to show you is this video, which I had very little hand in. I have to, I'm working with this. Um, one of the amazing things I think about uh, doing this work is for the first time in my 15 years doing this work, I'm working with a communications team. And 
they're they're extraordinary. They um, you know they've come to most of them have come to this with communication skill set and they're learning all the, the stuff on prevention and gender equality and so forth. But they're the ways in which they uh, can bring together and make a simple message out of something that I think is just far too complex is 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 really amazing. So we're, we're sort of learning how we can speak to this broader audience and and they developed this video for our launch. Um, note though, this isn't our social marketing campaign. This is just a little video like they pulled together for the launch. We still want to do a much bigger, you know, more comprehensive social marketing campaign. When I grow up, I want to be a pilot. When I grow up, I want to be a scientist. I want to be an artist. When I grow up, I want to be an architect. Police, lawyer, astrophysicist, firefighter. I want to be a nurse. And I want to be a pilot or something. When I grow up, I want to be a nun. When I grow up, my husband tells me what to do. When I grow up, my wife puts me first. I won't be seen or heard. When I grow up, I want to tell her who to be friends with. I'll beat my wife when she offends me. When I grow up, I'm going to end up in hospital because my husband hit me. This is the dream of no child ever. One in six Australian women have experienced physical or sexual violence from a current or former partner. One in five Australian women has experienced sexual violence. That means each of us knows one of these women. I know one of these women. Me. No child enters this world dreaming of committing violence. No man wakes up one morning and out of the blue murders his partner. The long road to family violence starts with the belief that women are possessions, not equals. Most men are not violent, but the vast majority of acts of domestic and sexual violence are perpetrated by men against women. Our beliefs about the way boys and girls, women and men, are supposed to act are formed in childhood. Around the world, gender stereotypes and unequal power between men and women are the most important underlying causes of family violence. We can stop this before it starts by saying no to attitudes, stereotypes and behaviours that support gender inequality and violence. We can help boys create more positive and healthier ways of being men. We've come a long way since the 70s. Violence against women is on the national political agenda and there's great work going on in our communities. But still, one woman is killed nearly every week by a male partner or ex-partner. The murder of children usually occurs in the context of family violence. Extreme violence often occurs when the woman tries to leave the relationship. And those who don't leave, live with countless acts of violence every day. This can't happen. Not on our watch. Not on our watch. Not on our watch. Our watch will challenge the attitudes, behaviours, social norms and practices that underpin and create violence against women and their children. We will engage the community, educate, raise public awareness and keep violence against women and their children on the national agenda until life is better for all. You can help us. It's the responsibility of all of us. Challenge stereotypes. Call out sexist attitudes. Speak out if you hear excuses for violence or victim blaming. Spread the word that violence is never an option or a solution. And there is no excuse. Acknowledge respect and equality when you see it. Celebrate our role models. It's up to you. It's up to me. It's up to us. Because we can create this world. When I grow up, I want to be proud of who I am. I want to be friends with everybody. When I grow up, I want to change the world. When I grow up, I want to be me. I want to be me. I want to be me. I want to be a superhero. When I grow up, I want everyone to be happy. We deserve to be equal. When I grow up, I want to be safe. I want to be safe. When I grow up, I want to be safe. Together we can work to end violence against women and children. It is time to stand up, to speak out, to take action on our watch. It's time to act on our watch. Um... It's yeah. Th I think yeah. They did a great job with that video. I'm, this it, this is what I'm. I'm very excited because I think this is the this is the first not only the first national organisation working in this space. It's the first time we've had all this communications sort of expertise applied to 
uh, this issue in Australia. So I think, um, yeah, there's huge potential for that. I, I just want to note as well, I, I, and I should note that the children, of course, were very well supported to do that very difficult role. They had all counselling support and so forth. They're very experienced actors already at their young age. Um, and yeah, they were, they were provided with all appropriate um, supports. Okay, how, how am I going for time now? I'm out of time. It's over. All right. Uh, oh, can I take a minute just to finish? And then, all right. Okay. Very quickly, what we're just doing in the next year, um, one of the really important things is this development of a national framework. So you've heard a couple of times about um, the Vic Health 2007 framework. Something that's been identified is we need something that's applicable to other jurisdictions because that was targeted to Victoria. We need to, what works in Victoria is not going to work in WA or NT, for example. We need to um, lift that up. Um, we also need to drill down into a lot of new areas. The picture has changed considerably since 2007. Things have moved on. We have more evidence. We 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 can really start drilling down into some of the gap areas, for example. I think intersectionality is, is one of those. Um, and the other thing is, is looking at what, what's worked in other areas of, uh, dare I say, engineered social change, I, <laughs> like uh, HIV AIDS prevention, like um, the road safety initiatives, the smoking and so forth. I think we could sort of learn a little from, uh, from those. Um, and yeah, and particularly also the interactions with what, what do we mean by prevention of violence against women and their children. Now we're doing the and their children bit. What does what does that mean? Um, I talked a little already of our priorities. Media work is, is very important. We're taking over the line. Some of you might know that it's a, it was funded under the last national plan. It's um, an online social marketing uh, tool for young people. Um, we're looking at doing a, a big community education program next year and we're also running a lot of um, pilot projects, uh, in, one in schools, one in hospitals at the moment and at the moment also one in culture and linguistically diverse communities in Victoria that one is, uh, with a view to thinking what's transferable about these programs. We don't want to just do them and then go, we want to, we want to really think about how do, we, how, does, how do we transfer it, systematise it, embed it, particularly the schools one. Um, we can't do it alone, I've said that a, a lot. I think that what we, what's, what's still lacking in Australia is this sort of architecture for prevention, almost like an infrastructure for prevention. So we do need whole of government support and that's all governments from Commonwealth, State Territory, down to the local level and at different, in different departments. We, 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 those of us who work in or have worked in women's policy units know it's, it's a big hard slog to run it on usually you know, three staff or whatever. We need education departments to be involved, health departments, you know, justice, police and so forth to all be involved. Um, leaders are, are obviously very important and again across our, our key sectors like education, sporting organisations and in population groups like, like Aboriginal male leaders are very important and in, in core communities. Shared frameworks and standards I've talked about. Workforce development sounds very dull, but if, if you could do one thing, I reckon it, that to invest in right now, invest in building people's capacity to understand the drivers of violence and the strategies to prevent it. In pre-service training, in all sorts of, like for teachers, for journalists, for community workers, and in in-service training, build that capacity and, and th those people will run, like those people will, will do prevention. That's, I think that's something that's really missing. Um, practice support and knowledge sharing so we don't have somebody learning something in the Northern Territory that isn't shared in New South Wales, for example, and data collection and monitoring so we can start measuring progress at the whole of population level. Stop just measuring it for participants in our programs, which is important, but lift it up and start thinking how do we actually start bringing down levels of violence at that population level. So at minus two minutes or minus three minutes, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.